and gentlemen, welcome to today's webinar on building an efficient medical cold chain infrastructure, a roadmap to effective healthcare delivery, brought to you by B Medical Systems in association with ET Health World. The impact of immunization during the COVID-19 pandemic has been profound, underscoring the critical value vaccines play in safeguarding public health. Today, we embark on this journey to explore India's remarkable immunization efforts and the challenges faced in vaccine delivery. I, Rashmi Mabian Kaur, Principal Correspondent at ethealthworld.com, would now like to welcome the esteemed speakers who have joined us today to dwell on the intricacies of vaccine delivery, role of sustainable cold chain systems, the meticulous strategies employed to ensure vaccine coverage reaches the last mile. To take forward this crucial discussion on building an efficient medical coaching infrastructure, please join me in welcoming our eminent panelists, Dr. Madan Gopal, Advisor, Public Health Administration, National Health Systems Resource Center, Ms. Urvashi Prasad, Director, Niti Aayog, Professor Dr. Anurag Agarwal, Professor, Department of Pediatrics, Molana Azad Medical College, and Mr. Zahad, Zaveri, Senior Director at Selco Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, Dr. Adapa Karthik couldn't join us today due to a sudden meeting. So uh, before going ahead, I would like to inform everyone that the panel discussion will be followed by a question and answer session. Attendees can share the questions in the chat window and our team will be addressing it towards the end of the session. Now, without any further ado, I would like to begin by exploring what are the most prevalent challenges. So starting with you, Ms. Urvashi, what are some of the existing challenges and policy gaps in current vaccine delivery system? And do you think there is a need for more stringent policies? How can this be helped by technology in bridging the existing gaps? Thank you uh, for inviting me for this uh, discussion and uh, thank you for the uh, question. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll talk about, you know, not just uh, vaccine, but, you know, the overall uh, pharmaceutical or medical, um, you know, sort of supply chain and and the uh, cold chain infrastructure in relation to that. Um, so I think, you know, historically uh, in India, we have had a big challenge with our uh, logistics overall. Um, and uh, there has been an over-reliance on road freight, um, unfavorable geographic conditions in many parts of the country, uh, poor cold chain infrastructure, and lack of a sustainable network. So even if you see our uh, pharma distribution, uh, over 70% of it is, is dependent on roads, um, and that exposes biopharmaceuticals to degradation. Uh, due to uneven topography and high temperature. And moreover, in obviously health, you know, in this space, uh, at least 20% or even more um, of the ten temperature sensitive health products um, are damaged on roadways, you know, due to the uh, deficient cold chains. Hmm. So uh, cold chain infrastructure, you know, historically in India, because, you know, now we have, of course, started to address a lot of these issues, especially by using technology. And but, you know, since you've asked me about challenges, I'm speaking about, you know, the challenges first that we have had historically. And of course, a lot of them we still need to address in many parts of the country. Um, you know, high capital costs, um, you know, skilled, the lack of skilled resources, uh, the the poor reverse, you know, logistics, uh, or not having access or integration. Uh, of the latest technologies. So these are, of course, you know, legacy issues, you know, that the country has had to deal with in this space. Um, but in fact, if you see pre-pandemic, uh, the cold chain network in India was still in its infancy, you know, but, but then we had a soaring demand for vaccines, you know, the COVID vaccines, we had rapid distribution requirements. And so that has really helped to transform uh, the sector, you know, and now we are seeing uh, storage and transportation facilities evolving with uh, cutting edge devices and optimized routes. Uh, we are, you know, seeing cold chain logistics embrace 
uh, innovations, you know, including the best of global innovations um, to, to, you know, kind of uh, bring the best facilities to India. So, you know, if I just give an example here uh, of, you know, you spoke of vaccines, that med medicines, vaccines, they require strictly regulated temperatures. Um, and the temperature demands vary, you know, according to the composition. So it's not any one particular, uh, you know, temperature which is required. Uh, so live virus vaccines, for instance, they thrive in, uh, say, the two to eight degrees, you know, spectrum. But if you look at mRNA vaccines, and that's why India didn't go in for a lot of the foreign vaccines, um, you know, because these mRNA vaccines require as low as minus 70 degrees uh, to remain effective. You know, so uh, because of this broad temperature range, the ultra low freezers, you know, are now gaining importance in storing vaccines, preventing uh, spoilage. And basically, you're seeing a lot of technological innovations coming in. So there's remote sensing, for instance, uh, because, you know, vaccination programs require temperature regulated uh, equipment in health centers. Uh, mm -hmm. So now we, we are making the use of remote sensing. There is smart tracking uh, so that, you know, the supply chains can be tracked using IoT and robotics and AI, etc., uh, so there's a lot of advancements and I can talk, of course, more in detail. But um, just to say that, you know, even pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, uh, we've come a long way. Um, but of course, you know, there's still a lot more we need to do um, in terms of addressing the inequities because we're a very large country and uh, there's obviously, you know, very, very different geographical and other logistical uh, conditions which are prevailing across the country. So we need to be able to address the remaining gaps and the disparities and the inequities, but we've made huge progress and technology is really the next frontier for us in you know taking us to the next level. Very nice views. Uh, so the same question is for Dr. Madan. What, are, what is your opinion on uh, how we can tackle these challenges? Thank you, Rashmi. One of the first thing uh, which I want to say that we are having the largest immunization program in the world. That's one thing they, from the public sector side of point of view. Mm -hmm. The other thing is uh, we started our immunization uh, for addressing the vaccine preventable disease way back in 1978. So then uh, looking at the success of that previously for six uh, antigens, now we are covering 12 antigens. That, that means we are providing immunization, universal immunization program against 12 uh, diseases. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Second thing, when we are doing the immunization, because if you we should appreciate that every year we are having a cohort of around 2 crore children which have been added up and we are providing immunization to all these 12 crore people, uh, 2 crore people. But having said this, over the last many years, over the last, uh, I think, 3-4 decades, we have been able to streamline the immunization process in the country, which is the largest immunization program of the world. We are, every year we are immunizing the pregnant women around the same co cohort that means 2 crore and 2 crore. That means we are immunizing them mm -hmm. against uh, this uh, polio, TB, polio, DPT, MMR, measles rubella, mumps, measles rubella, then rotavirus, pneumococcal, Japanese encephalitis. We are mm -hmm. inoculating them. That's what thing. But over the years we have built in a system. A system comprises of, that means from the vaccine manufacturers right up to the beneficiary, the cold chain is maintained. That means we have invested a lot into the cold chain. Uh, and the example, the reflection is seen when we inoculated the COVID vaccination. Mm. Had it not been the capacities which we have uh, built in over the last many years, it would have been very difficult to inoculate 2.5 crore vaccination in the day. That was the cap capacities which we were having. If you talk about the system which are there, at the from the vaccine manufacturer, the vaccine reaches the GM, uh, the government medical store depots, which are there at the uh, around four or five places. At all the state uh, places, we are having a state walk-in cooler and walk-in freezers. That means the vaccine through insulated, uh, that, that mechanism is there, through insulated uh, this vans, uh, it reaches the state uh, walk-in coolers and the walk-in freezers. From there, it is sent to the districts where district also you are having a store. From there, at the CSCs and the PSCs level, you are having deep freezers and the ILRs, ice land uh, refrigerator. Because looking at the terrain and the difficulties, we have evolved our scheme 
to see mm-hmm. that ki, even in case of any power outage, the vaccine is uh, not spoiled. Mm-hmm. That kind of mechanism has evolved. From the uh, CSCs and the PSCs, uh, the vaccines are transported to the immunization site through the vaccine carriers, through cold boxes and vaccine carriers, it is happening. Then mechanism has evolved and it, we have perfected that thing. The other thing, important thing which has happened, because to identify the challenge, we should understand the system first. Other thing which has evolved over the many years is when so much logistics are involved, so much uh, number is involved. So we have tried to evolve that electronic vaccine intelligence network, that is even system. It was meant for cold chain maintenance and uh, logistics, this which was eventually become the COVID platform, which uh, we have seen the beauty of that COVID platform. So electronic vaccine intelligence network was there, which has helped us in managing the logistics. That's mm-hmm. one thing. So this is a network which is available. That means from the manufacturer to the beneficiary, we are trying to see that the trying to see that the vaccine potency is maintained. The vaccine potency can only be maintained or the efficiency can only be maintained when the cold chain is maintained. Mm-hmm. So we have invested a lot right from creating uh, stores, the regional stores, to the deep freezers and the ILRs and this. Deep freezers can be run on electricity, on solar, and other that different models are there. But essentially, we have invested in that, that cold chain is there. And I can guarantee that uh, for this 12 vaccine preventable disease, it's, if you are taking an uh, antigen shot in a government setup, then I'm sure about the potency because we do have vaccine wild monitors to maintain the potency. As we were discussing before the before going live, we do from the just uh, from the tick methods, now we are using the digital modes for maintain, maintaining the temperatures. And the temp- temperatures are seen on a regular basis. Every two hours, three hours, the cold chain temperatures are taken. That's That mechanism is there. But having said this, we still, still do have some challenges mm. because uh, there's few habitations. Like uh, recently, we have launched this uh, Pradhan Mantri Janman Yojana. Why it was launched? Because there are few habitations where still, we, despite reaching up to a population of 3,000, 5,000 in the form of Aishman Aruki Mandirs and the outreach through the mobile medical unit, still there are pockets which are remaining. Mm-hmm. For that also, what we are trying to do is we are having an Indra-Dhanush mission, indra program, which was launched into the, which is catch-up round, so that the people who are left out, they are covered in the immunization. This kind of setup is there mm-hmm. in the public health immunization. We are already doing it, and mm-hmm. it is going stronger and stronger. And mm-hmm. there are people who are trained and capacitated for doing this thing. But uh, the challenges, uh, now I'm coming to the challenges, the challenges which uh, we envisaged is the last mile delivery. Still, as I mentioned, there are a lot of pockets where we are still to reach the primitive tribal groups, the prioritized uh, vulnerable tribal groups for which a special program is launched and the menus have been launched to reach this population and these pockets. And to reach this last mile, you, as I mentioned, the in the Dhanush mission and the Dhanush program, which previously used to be the Shishu Shuraksha Devas, was while when the vaccine preventable diseases started. The other problem which we face is vaccine hesitancy. If you look at the things, the around 29% of the individuals, they still exhibit vaccine hesitancy even after four or five decades of this immunization program, still we are struggling with vaccine hesitancy. Even a small, uh, if some antigen, some adverse events happen, that results in vaccine hesitancy and a lot of communication and other activities have to be carried out to address that issue. Mm-hmm. Other challenges, the cold chain maintenance. Still, there are areas where power outages and other things are there. Apart from that, breakdown of equipments do happen. That also is being handled on a day-to-day basis because the logistics management is a key for this. Because if I'm inoculating something, the efficiency and potency of the vaccine right up to the beneficiary is to be maintained. So that I am very confident that if I'm inoculating somebody, then the vaccine would at least start inducing some antibody response into that in an effective way. So cold chain is an important area. So a lot of uh, requirement is there. A lot of things can be done. So apart from that, other thing is human resources limitation. So all the vaccinations happen uh, in, uh, in the form of uh, what we do. We collect all the people during the village health and nutrition days. And all the people are being inoculated by the auxiliary nurse midwife or the AM. 
with the support of asha and the anganwadi workers hmm. but the major thing is some of the areas there is vacancy of the oxygen nurse midwife we have to find out but the nhm has been able to bridge this gap also this is one of the other challenge which is there the other thing is when we are inoculating so much number of people so how the data should come but fortunately what now we are doing it we are trying to capture the data we are linking all the beneficiaries with aadhar because of the beneficiary services and the covin platform which was beautifully used during the uh, this covid times this which was an extension of the e vaccine system which was customized to uh, deliver the covid vaccine now we are using that covin vaccine platform for the universal immunization program and all the beneficiaries uh, their aba ids are generated and now they have been embed after embedding the aba ids through aadhar now we have been able to track apart from one of the challenges which was uh, there was scheduling the immunization sessions that session is also now because the logistics is been taken care what kind of vaccine is available what kind of uh, stock is available at a particular point and based on that how many inoculations uh, can be done in a particular session that is already done on a monthly basis uh, all the vaccinations in the government sector happens to village health and nutrition day as well as in the institutions primary health centers community health center that are there besides that to address all these challenges you might have seen two major program three major program one is the aishman bhav program wherein uh, camps have been organized at the community health centers as well as the, the sub health centers or the aishman arogya mandir so that the people who are left out who are not covered they are also covered through this vaccination program the other important program which has been government uh, has launched is the vaccine bharat yatra in which we are trying to see that the people who are left out who are the, for them also the immunization sessions are being the other third program which has been recently launched on the 15th of this is pm janman program in which the prioritize the vulnerable tribal population they are also been covered through mbs Mm-hmm. apart from that after all this uh, setup uh, we do have around 1800 uh, mobile medical units and the mobile medical units uh, they have been tasked to provide immunization a similar kind of mechanism do exist in the urban areas but i can bet that uh, if you go to any government institution the, if you talk about the experience of vaccination in the public sector and the private sector and the people who have taken inoculation in the government sector for covid they will definitely have a very very good uh, patient experience as compared to others i will stop here thank you very much okay so uh, dr madan very uh, elaborately explained us what are the developments that we've gone through but there still exists some challenges and some of the major challenges that we are going to be addressing today will be how uh, medical cold chain infrastructure can be sustainable so my next question is for mr shahab how important do you think is to develop a sustainable medical cold chain infrastructure and how can uh, uh, can this help in overcoming the last mile challenges thank you rashmi and thank you to the other speakers as well for introducing the challenges um my name is shahab of course but i'm from this organization called selco foundation we work at the intersection of solar energy sustainable energy access and healthcare so in this process we are uh, solar powering a lot of health facilities in india uh, in partnership with the ministry of uh, health in partnership with the nhsrc as well um, right now our target is to power 25000 healthcare facilities in india by the year 2026 um, this of course covers um, a large number of cold chain points um, mm-hmm. especially at the last mile where cold chain is being delivered to the um, to the end user the previous speakers have already spoken about the problems on logistics and um, last mile delivery and i want to elaborate on that from from our experience um when i'm when you're asking for sustainability the the realm of sustainability that i'm considering is also environmental sustainability and economic uh, sustainability um because of this large scale program that we're running where we're assessing the energy needs and the energy problems in in health facilities while all health facilities have access to electricity uh largely in the country it's 100% electrified there is definitely two problems with electricity that still persist in in uh, in a lot of areas especially remote areas which is the unreliability of electricity uh 
definitely certain terrains provide uh, challenges to provide electricity throughout and mm-hmm. and we can see um, a few hours of power cuts at least every day and and especially during monsoon seasons etc maintenance periods can be very long and and that's when we also see unreliability coming in um also in a lot of remote areas we see power quality being a big issue um and and that sort of hampers um uh, cold chain infrastructure as well and and the economic link to this is that and and from most of the assessments that we've carried out we're seeing the all the phcs that are largely storing cold chain uh, at the last mile they're spending at least 4 to 5000 rupees on diesel every month because to mitigate the vaccine wastage that would potentially takes place it's a it's a expensive commodity so you don't want to lose out on it so you will plan for diesel but that diesel expenditure in itself is a sizable amount even if we consider 31000 phcs that are there in india even if 50% of them are facing this sort of issue um, then spending on good sustainable backup sources especially solar energy completely makes a business case over diesel expenditures that might be taking place and because this is a fossil fuel um the environmental impacts can also be tremendous when we look at it at a india level scale um this will save us save our health system so much money in the long run that all of this money can be actually allocated to reaching the last mile pockets where training and uh consumer outreach might be uh, a bigger issue or consumer awareness be a bigger issue mm-hmm. um so both environmentally and this we think that this uh, powering of primary healthcare facilities of sub centers of community health centers is a very important step towards maintaining the cold chain simply because the cold chain occupies the largest percentage of the energy load of a primary healthcare center as well the topmost way that you know we think that to give you one quick example um even in one in, in a southern state uh, we were doing and we had gone for an assessment and because of regular grid maintenance um the the idea was that for half a day the grid maintenance would be going on but mm-hmm. somehow for some reason it got extended for a larger period of time mm-hmm. and an ambulance had to be called to transfer all the vaccines from one phc to another phc now we need to think about whether the the other phc that maybe the store is also very far away from that so does the other phc have enough space that creates a lot of challenges in the day to day management of the uh, doctors and the health staff all the energy that they could be putting in into patient care now can we reduce that burden on them also is mm-hmm. the question so mm-hmm. there are solutions that are already available very good ones so i think that it's time to get into this aspect of great that that's like a positive note here uh, coming to you professor dr anurag what are the gaps in storage and administration of vaccines impacting their efficacy and what should be the best practices while storing and administering these uh, vaccines that pediatricians must follow good afternoon and uh, thank you for having me on this very important discussion so um uh, vaccination is one of the very important uh, national programs which are running which is running across the country and uh, has saved millions of lives across the country mm-hmm. so uh, the aim is of course uh, from control to elimination to eradication of diseases the best example we have is smallpox followed by polio which is now el been eliminated from at least india and of course covid vaccines we had a great experience wherein we were able to fight off the challenge with the massive large scale vaccinations mm. now talking about pediatricians so we have to understand that uh, 90% of immunization is done by health workers other than pediatricians mm. so the pediatricians of course they do play an important role uh, but the majority of vaccination is done by uh, anms anganwadis uh, medical officers who are working in phcs and dispensaries and other government setups pediatricians definitely have a major role in creating guidance for immunization practices and developing mechanisms and uh, thought processes by which we are able to increase the coverage and prevent uh, failure of vaccination so now coming to gaps of cold chain so cold chain has three important components one is personnel 
that is the health worker and of course people involved with uh, uh, transportation of the vaccines second is equipment which is uh, which implies of course again uh, vehicles for transportation refrigerators monitoring equipments and of course electricity supply which is a very important component and then the procedures procedures implies that what kind of uh, uh, guidelines you are following what kind of uh, trainings you are doing what kind of audits you are doing how are you monitoring uh, the whole process so uh, these three components are uh, mainly involved in cold chain maintenance now talking about equipment first so um, poor monitoring of vaccine temperature during transport and storage this was one of the biggest challenges which we have had over last uh, 20 to 30 years. Other than that, the quality of equipment available with pediatricians is another issue. So these two issues have been uh, taken care of over the last two decades. And I'm happy to say that in government setups, there is a rapid positive development of infrastructure which has taken place. And uh, we have been able to move ahead from the domestic refrigerators to ice line refrigerators and purpose-built vaccine refrigerators. So this is a massive change. See, uh, whenever you have a program of a scale wherein you are injecting millions of children every year, even a single uh, failure or uh, adverse event, which is covered in the media, gives a bad name to the program and causes a lot of fear in the society and which leads to disruption of the program. So there are multiple examples to this. We had problems with the MMR vaccine where there was a story uh, we, in Delhi, we were not able to do MR campaign for certain reasons. So uh, we have to be very careful and very stringent when we are dealing with mass level programs. So uh, government is doing very well. The electric supply, which uh, my previous speaker was talking about, in yes, in cities, uh, it has improved uh, to the level that we are taking electricity for granted. And of course, we have power backups. Yes, dispensaries and PHCs have a problem. They have power cuts and you need to maintain some kind of a regular supply because whatever refrigeration system we are using can maintain your vaccines up to some hours, say uh, from six hours to maybe 20, 12 to 24 hours, depending upon the model and uh, method we are using. But after that, you need them to have an electric supply so that the uh, whole equipment cools down and it is uh, again functional for next 24, 24 hours at least. So yes, electricity supply is a very important component. Then coming to uh, temperature monitoring which was once upon a time manual, as I was talking uh, earlier also, wherein a nurse would uh, uh, take out the thermometer from the fridge, have a look at the reading on the thermometer and put on a chart, paper chart and hang it outside the fridge. So this was at her whims and fancies and because she was on duty, she will not give you a wrong temperature because she does not want to be penalized for it. And therefore, the uh, problem was that we did not have true data of uh, temperature monitoring. Then the VVMs came, which are sensitive, but for VVM to show you a result, a lot of temperature variation has to take place. And now we have moved over to digital uh, temperature monitoring, wherein there are digital uh, data loggers, which are uh, which are mini computers. And uh, you put in the data logger after calibration into your uh, refrigerator near the vaccines and you take out, take it out once uh, in a week or so and attach it again to your computer terminal. And it gives you a reading throughout the what has happened throughout the week. It takes temperature every 20 minutes or so. And if there is any deviation in between, it gives you an alarm also from the fridge itself. So you not, need not wait for the whole week. It will give you an alarm whenever there is a uh, deviation and you can get data for the uh, whole week uh, at the end of the week. So these equipments are there, which are being used in government setups now. So they are coming into the government setups. They have been approved and we are using them. Now, next part is coming to the private sector. So now all this equipment, data loggers, everything costs money. And the sadly, the private sector is still lagging in this field because see, they are uh, small, unorganized, uh, not unorganized, but smaller setups wherein uh, money does make a difference. So they are still uh, with those domestic refrigerators. 
which are uh, depending again upon the person who is using it and then the chemist or the pharmacist who is storing the vaccine uh, what kind of training he has what kind of mindset he has so what does he do with the uh, temperature monitoring so they are still stuck with the domestic refrigerators now what are the problems of domestic refrigerators number one they are not meant for storing vaccines they are meant for storing vegetables and food items and their temperature control is very crude so now if you have a crude temperature control for example in uh, winters in a city like delhi when the temperature is around 4 or 5 degrees in the night uh, the temperature of your uh, equipment will go to below 2 degrees even 0 degree and in extreme uh, harsh summers when the temperature is 40 45 degrees uh, the temperature crosses 8 goes to 10 12 degrees and believe uh, believe me i have been using a domestic refrigerator for some vaccine related studies and uh, i had huge problems with the data logger not with the data logger but with the equipment that is the domestic refrigerator because there was invariably loss of uh, temperature maintenance every week during summers it used to cross and during winters it used to go below and needed frequent adjusting in even after adjustments it could not uh, give us the correct needed temperature and i had to file deviations along the way so these uh, equipments are not meant for uh, keeping vaccines again after uh, uh, other than that you need defrosting so whenever you defrost the temperature will go over 8 degrees and then multiple openings of the fridge and all that then the variation in temperature in various parts of the fridge this is another problem so all this uh, is there which needs some kind of uh, solutions so that uh, the practicing pediatrician in the private sector is able to have good quality vaccine and the vaccine efficacy is not affected see vaccines again there are two kinds one those are heat sensitive second which are cold sensitive so okay. heat sensitive vaccines uh, cannot go over 8 degrees and cold sensitive cannot go below maybe 2 degrees or maybe 1 or 0 or 1 degree and therefore and it's a mix of both which has to be kept in those refrigerators so we need good equipment in the private sector with good temperature control with good monitoring good uh, transport facilities so that there is no loss of efficacy during transport now coming to the second part of the question what are the best practices so as i have discussed we need to upgrade equipment to ice line refrigerators or specially vaccine uh, purposed refrigerators then we need uh, digital temperature monitoring of all uh, sites which are using vaccines so there was a very good initiative uh, by the name of even wherein uh, digital monitoring is being done of uh, these equipments and whenever there is a deviation it uh, alarm comes to the person who is using it as well as to this uh, headquarters the main site wherein the from which the vaccine is supplied so we need some kind of a monitoring system a centralized monitoring system for all vaccines which should be tamper proof so nobody can interfere in the uh, way that uh, system is run then regular training of manpower who handles vaccine because a uh, a person a pharmacist or a chemist who stores the vaccine does not know which vaccine to keep where or switch off switches off the light at night when he goes home because electricity is pretty costly so all these things have to be taken care of he has to be trained then arrangement of a backup refrigerator or a backup system wherein you can store the vaccines in case of emergencies for example your refrigerator breaks down or you have a power failure so you need to have a equipment Uh, other than the one you are using and you need to have a written guideline as to how to move the vaccines what are the what kind of uh, equipment you will be using to move the vaccine and whom to inform how to do it so all that needs to have a written protocol then mm-hmm. another problem which we see is calibration of equipment nobody does calibration of equipment so once you buy equipment it is there till it uh, goes kaput so it till it breaks down it is being used so uh, some kind of regular calibration maybe a six monthly or a yearly calibration of equipment mm-hmm. needs to be done then another good practice is uh, written guidance and written policy of vaccination so uh, a new person joins he should know he should be given a document ke okay we have a written policy read this up and then we will tell you what to do because hands on learning uh, of course is important but before that he has to know what he is getting into otherwise there will be lots of lots of uh, there will be loss of efficacy and 
damage to vaccines and vaccination failures. So then you need guidelines for all procedures like storage, stock in, stock out, near expiry vaccine, what to do in case of breakdowns, training guides for induction of new employees, temperature audit. So suppose you audit and you find that in a particular season or at a particular employee's working hours, the temperature is going haywire. That means uh, either he's opening the fridge too frequently or he's not shutting the fridge properly. So temperature mm -hmm. audit, then calibration guidelines, calibrating every six months, keeping a record, equipment maintenance record. So all these uh, guidelines, written guidelines and protocols should be in place. So these are some best, best practices which can improve our vaccination uh, vaccination efficacy in the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anurag, for beautifully underlining the best practices the pediatricians should be following. So uh, my next question is for Ms. Urvashi. How can implementing the right digital infrastructure across cold chain networks transform last mile connectivity? Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot has uh, already been said on this, but um, I'll, you know, I'll just... Uh, maybe make a few other uh, quick points at a, at a higher level. You know, progress that we've made, uh, especially uh, post-COVID, uh, in terms of especially the use of technology and the integration of technology. And we've heard a lot about that, you know, in terms of the, the remote sensing and the smart tracking, the IoT, um, all of this. And in fact, um, you know, we are expecting the cold chain market itself to be a huge market uh, in India, you know, to and a huge market opportunity as well, you know, apart from the fact that it obviously uh, is crucial for the medical sector and the health sector. Um, but, um, you know, it's also a big market opportunity. And I think that should lead to further uh, kind of innovation uh, in the space. But I think, um, you know, one other very interesting area where, of course, technology is being used is that we're using it for predictive uh, analytics uh, via artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to analyze consumer behavior and also forecast uh, potential uh, supply chain risks. So uh, that is another uh, very interesting use that, uh, you know, we're now putting uh, technology to. And um, in fact, the entire supply chain, you know, whether it's the shipping routes um, or, you know, any aspect of it, uh, they're using real time GPS positioning. Uh, so a lot of this is being used, but I think it's very important to, uh, like I said, we are a very diverse country. We are at very different stages of development still across the country. And so there is a lot that needs to be done to uh, bridge those equity gaps that exist, especially rural, remote areas, areas with difficult terrains, tribal areas. And, and of course, in COVID, we saw, and you know, a lot of those uh, advancements and innovations have been spoken about also by other panelists. Um, that and, and, and in general, you know, India's vaccination program is one of the largest and most advanced in the world, because, you know, even if you look at the U.S., um, for the COVID vaccination, they were still giving you, you know, these slips of paper. Uh, whereas, you know, here we had pretty much everything digitized. Obviously, you know, there were issues, there were challenges. Uh, the app, you know, would have issues or lacunae from time to time. And that's, I think, only inevitable in a country of our, uh, you know, size and diversity. But, but we, what we managed to achieve was still phenomenal, you know, compared to um, even where some of the developed world is currently. So I think all of that is very good. Um, but I, I, I also agree with the point that was made about uh, environmental sustainability um, and so use of solar, etc. And I think it is very important to implement sustainability to the state of the art uh, medical grade devices, um, monitoring their operations through uh, remote, uh, you know, sensors and enhancing transparency through software uh, solutions. So I think these are all, uh, you know, very, very important uh, initiatives that we do need to take. And of course, uh, you know, sustainability in everything now, as we look at Vixit Bharat at 2047, which is the overall goal that the prime minister has uh, set out for us. Uh, sustainability in every way is a very big element of that. So, of course, we want to enhance and maximize the efficiency 
um, of the health system, the medical system and technology, you know, is going to play a critical role there. Um, but that has to be balanced out with sustainability. So I think that is, uh, you know, one very uh, important message. And of course, I think lastly on technology, I will just say that a lot of times we get very excited, carried away, you know, with these are all buzzwords uh, that have now come into being in terms of AI and ML and IoT and, and you know, but ultimately uh, whatever system, we come up with, they have to be very contextualized uh, to our, you know, local conditions, prevailing conditions. They have to work there, you know, and they have to be able to work at scale. And all the stakeholders, it's very important to build the capacity of, because sometimes with technology, we can forget the human uh, interface and the human, uh, you know, element. So it's very important to build the capacity of all stakeholders to now be able to use these technologies effectively in this context and to integrate them uh, with the entire, uh, you know, pharma, medical, supply chain, value chain. So, yeah, the, I'll, I'll leave you with these uh, comments and I'll uh, I'll just need to leave as well for a, for a meeting. But uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Ms. Urvashi, for joining and thank you for those great views. So we'll be uh, moving on to the next question. The next question is for Mr. Shahab. What role can smart storage equipment play in driving efficient cold storage? And what are the future technologies that can help in building sustainable medical cold chain infrastructure, which can work towards solving energy associated problems? Sure. Thank you, Rashmi. Uh, like previously mentioned, I think a lot of the a lot of the examples were already talked about. I'll talk about two more that were not already mentioned to, to give to give an idea of what else is happening right now. Um, I'll, I'll start with a story on last mile uh, outreach of vaccines from the sub center down to the village and particularly in a region like the northeast of india where terrains are so difficult and and distances between villages can be very long typically what happens is at the sub center level uh, vaccines are not stored permanently it's usually stored at the primary healthcare center uh, the anm at the sub center would usually go in the morning on the allocated vaccine day and travel to the primary health center, pick up the vaccines from there in a ice box, in a, in a vaccine carrier, a passive vaccine carrier. And that would then be delivered down to the villages. In, in uh, many cases, um, the distances between these villages is actually really long. Um, and in one particular case, the a &M had to travel from the sub center down to the village for four to five hours on foot and um, the holdover periods of these vaccine carriers is limited um, so you can imagine the a &M rushing to the phc in the morning then making it to every village about six villages or so and then coming back in the evening to return it to the phc because uh, the vaccines will then get spoiled um, and and that's where um, these new technologies, we've been working with a lot of companies now on this. One of them that, that we have deployed to a large extent is um, a portable vaccine carrier, which uses phase change material uh, within it. So the holdover period at the carrier level increases to eight to 10 hours, even in cold conditions or even in warm conditions rather. And um, that tremendously changes the, the ease of operations for an a &M the the cost that are involved so what the anm can now do is pick it up in the morning and then even wait to deliver it at, back to the phc at a more comfortable time mm -hmm. um because the whole sub center is also solar powered the vaccine carrier can actually just be plugged in at the sub center level itself and the vaccine can also be stored till the next time that they are used or returned to the phc at a you know like a more easier time probably the next morning um, they can also freely ca go to the villages, spend enough time over there without worrying about the fact that, you know, the vaccines are going to get spoiled and then rushing from one place to another, not being able to do enough outreach activities and so on as well. So multiple effects because of a cool new technology that has come out by the private sector. Um, another example on the future tech, uh, I'll quickly, I don't think this is really future, but it's it's a different kind of technology that's been implemented by quite a few people right now is drones for uh, logistics, improving logistics. What 
this does is many a times in these remote areas having centralized stores doesn't make a lot of sense you might not have enough volume in the first place to maintain storage systems everywhere so this is something that is being experimented on not just with vaccines but also sometimes with blood samples um, or other kinds of medical products and um, it's like a hub and spoke where vaccines are delivered just in time rather than um, rather than you know having that central that 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 store being available at the mm -hmm. last mile uh, so this is especially important if phcs etc are really far away uh, mm -hmm. from the sub center or or on and so on and so forth so I've, i there were three questions i think i've clubbed that here and uh, okay yeah thank you so uh, this is the last question i and it is addressed to dr madan and also your views dr anurag how crucial is training and capacity building for healthcare professionals involved in cold management system starting with dr madan i think uh, this has been already answered because the issues and other thing regarding the cold chain they have been explicitly expressed uh, uh, during the by the earlier speaker but nevertheless i will just highlight what we have been doing because the whole essence of this vaccination program is maintaining the potency of the vaccine mm. if you are able to maintain the potency of the vaccine and this potency of the vaccine is a crucial thing and it will reflect the efficiency because we are inoculating we don't know whether the vaccine is efficient or not but at least we can ensure the potency of the vaccine by maintaining the cold chain that's why this people become very important for the program success also the cold chain becomes very important you see the why the vaccine in mrna vaccine the pfizer vaccine could not work in uh, south africa why could not work because they don't didn't have the cold chain to they have given vaccines to them they have donated vaccine but they were not knowing how to store that vaccine and use that thing that's one thing that's mm -hmm. a different thing but we do have training program for uh, maintenance of the cold chain we have understood that the, there needs to be because the breakdown time the hold over time is there is limited mm. but if some ailers or refrigerator breaks down we need to train them for maintenance of all these things that's one thing that maintenance aspect is already been taken maintenance of this uh, the deep freezers the ailers as well as the this your vaccine carriers the cold boxes this this is required so mm. our training program is that the national institute of health and family welfare they usually undertake training programs all the people who are handling the cold chain equipments and other things second thing if you look at the the one of the other important aspect is use of technology for monitoring the cold chain how much how many cold chains are working or not so we are trying to we, we were using the even out the covin platform would be used increasingly for monitoring the status of this cold chain vaccine Hmm. the other aspect of the cold chain is uh, uh, the safety and accountability in case of any uh, uh, if the while uh, is a uh, repeated uh, heating and cooling that how it may if it happens if the vaccine while monitors they show a, a, a change in color so at that time this vaccine handlers they can take a call they can inform that the vaccine is not suitable for vaccination so we need to train them So, so that's why this training and vaccine this uh, becomes very important the other important aspect which we need to emphasize is the data management record keeping of all these equipments we do have program for annual maintenance uh, contract for this deep freezers and the ailers that that is now inbuilt but who will track the cold chain handlers have to track it they have to maintain data they have to maintain record hmm. apart from that in case of any adversities just happened which has been pointed out by shahab that in case of any adversity is the what is the next line of action and we need to train them on that kind of action also and obviously all these aspects all this training needs they have been addressed uh, in the training needs uh, in the training program which has been rolled which has been rolled out across the country and nij of the do is the nodal agency for doing this training program that means we are on the right track of seeing that the cold chain equipments everything is maintained so that we can at least bring in confidence into the people that at least whatever vaccine from the manufacturers to the beneficiary the cold chain is maintained the potency is ensured and the vaccine while monitors which are there in now all the vaccines that is also is not changing so this at least we can at least give up give confidence and assurance that whatever vaccines which we are 
having in the universal immunization program, national program. So that is safe, potent, and efficient. Your views, Dr. Anurag. Yeah, uh, I think Sarah has highlighted a lot of important points. And uh, training and capacity building is a very important component of any any government program or in fact of any uh, system which we need to run. Mm -hmm. See, uh, pediatricians uh, also have to read how to manage cold chain. Things have changed over the last two decades. Equipment has changed, guidelines have moved on, and pediatricians do read. But as I said, again, only uh, well, uh, that more than 90% of immunization is done by people who are not pediatricians, healthcare workers, but not pediatricians. And Sir has rightly pointed out that uh, NIHFW and state governments together conduct lots of annual programs in which uh, they train the nursing staff and the Ashas and Anganwadis uh, and uh, medical officers who are posted in immunization centers as to how to run the program as per guidelines. Uh, we have a problem of rotation of nurses in hospitals and uh, dispensaries wherein a trained nurse is moved out from immunization to some other, uh, say for another ward, for example, orthopedic ward, so the training is lost. Or for the training, somebody else is sent who's not working in immunization clinic. Of course, these minor glitches are there. But yes, we have a program in uh, place in the government. Now coming back to the private sector, there is no training program there for private sector. Nobody does it. The government also does not invite uh, private pediatricians or nominations from private sector pediatricians or people in private sector who are giving immunizations to send their staff for training. So I think this component needs to be included uh, in the government programs that uh, practitioner can be uh, practitioners can be requested to send their staff who can go to uh, these trainings and learn how to manage cold chain, how to manage vaccines, how to prevent loss of efficacy in vaccines. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, so when somebody goes for training, he will be given guidelines. He will be uh, told what is calibration, what is equipment maintenance, what is the temperature data logger monitoring, how to do it. So yes, uh, these, these are important then which vaccine to keep where if he has a domestic refrigerators for example if you use a domestic refrigerator uh, you need to keep t series vaccines in the lower shelf whereas uh, the uh, heat sensitive vaccines in the upper shelf so bcg and opv will be topmost below that there will be mmr and below that it will be t series vaccine and hepatitis b and maybe typhoid vaccine and rabies vaccine so all these kinds of trainings should be given have to be imparted to anybody who is working with vaccines. In fact, a certificate course also can be started by some agency in cold chain maintenance. Our pharmacists who store these vaccines, they also need to be trained. Yes, there is a licensing mechanism. Every pharmacist cannot sell a vaccine. To sell a vaccine, you need to have a special uh, license, which is, which is provided by the licensing authority. I do not know which one, I don't remember. But... Uh, these people need to be constantly trained so that their knowledge and skill is upgraded because once they get a certificate, they will not go for any training and things change, they do not know about it. So yes, uh, upgradation of skills are required and this should be a, a phenomena which should be a part of the curriculum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anurag. So this brings us uh, to the end of this discussion. I just wanted to um, share one quick uh, yes. thought uh, on this training and capacity building outside of the infrastructure and that sort of training. There's an interesting point around training of uh, end users also building health outreach and how that sort of affects the cold chain. Um, in a lot of times what happens is that a vial of a vaccine will have multiple doses. And when you go into a really remote area and uh, there is so much superstition around vaccines or some sort of um, apprehension towards taking up the vaccine, then that entire vial cannot be used. And uh, and that impacts that cold chain delivery also considerably. Uh, so looking at health outreach of, of how accepting people are towards vaccines is also important in certain areas and, and perhaps some effort should also be uh, strengthened there uh, to complement the, all the great work that the government is already doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shahab. Uh, we have uh, one 
audience question. So, how to tackle organized and uh, how to tackle unorganized and substandard vaccine cold chain equipment in the market through enhancing policies and stringent quality certification? Dr. Madan, I addressed you. It's a very uh, broad question, which uh, because uh, in the government sector, I can tell that uh, the specifications are defined. Because uh, if you are buying a vaccine carrier, so the specification are decided. The specification for that uh, committees are there. The experts are there in that committee. They decide the specification based on the specification procurement happens. Even after that, the quality assurance mechanism is there that, uh, for the government sector. But once it comes to the private sector, because that's rightly pointed out by Anuragji that uh, the, the training is more important and they are using the common refrigerators for storing the vaccines and uh, when, the, when the store is shut during the night, uh, they usually shut all the things. That's one thing. But the question but is that if we have set a standard, that like for an INR, this is a specification, these are standards. What is the turnaround time? What is the holding time? So if if we are able to decide on the holding time for a ILR or a deep freezer, at least we are ensuring something. That means if in case of power outage and other things, at least the vaccine will be safe for three hours, for, for two days, three days, four days, that kind of thing. But for the government side, from the government side, specifications are listed out. They are decided to which kind of this with the help of international experts as well as because inter from the international experts, the UNICEF and the WHO, they usually help us with the specification. But there are other experts also at the Director General Health Services who are experts in bringing out the specification. And based on the specification, tenders and other things are quoted and based on that procurement happens. And a quality assurance mechanism is also in place for ensuring that whatever equipment are being procured, they are there. Besides that, we do have... Uh, a scheme for comprehensive uh, maintenance contract. Because once you are ordering something, it has to, it is an inbuilt comprehensive control uh, contract mechanism. That means uh, for three years or five years, the equipment would be on the site, would be serviced by the uh, provider. That's one thing. Second thing, when the equipments which are beyond the uh, CMC, uh, the annual maintenance contracts are being supported uh, by the government. So that the function the functionality of the equipments are being maintained as per the specification, the equipment have been supplied so that the potency, the whole objective is that key, how to maintain the potency and efficiency of the vaccine by maintaining the cold chain. That is ensure. I think I've been able to answer that. For the yes. private sector, uh, for regulating the devices and other things, if they are manufacturing it, if somebody is trying to buy it, they have to buy as per the specification, standards, requirement, holding time, and as well as in case of any outage, how many days it can the iceland refrigerators if it is uh, cooled properly it can hold a vaccine for three to seven days depending on the area from other places so that kind of is iceland refrigerators uh, they have strengthened the program like anything the deep freezers are there to for the, and the vaccine carriers so eight to 12 hours you can hold and after one session you can come back because the a &Ms usually they you they have a group chart to overcome the problem of that, they do have a root chart in which if only one session is per day, if not six sessions, seven days. She collects the vaccine, goes to the session site. For reaching the session site also, some transport, even the motorcycle and other things have been provided. That means she can hire a motorcycle and go to that site, use the vaccine and come back. But there are other policies also even if a single child is there, some of the program, if a single child is there, usually nowadays what happens in the village health and nutrition days, you collect all the people and based on that, you open the vial. But some of, for, for more of the vaccines, the policy is that even a single child is there, you open the vial and then let the things discard. And you see that how efficient our workers are there. In the COVID times, usually the manufacturer, they put in one dose extra, factoring 10% to wastage of the doses. So for in a COVID vaccine, for a 10 dose while, there were 11 doses. Our workers are so efficient in uh, minimizing the wastages. That means instead of 10 doses, they have inoculated 11 doses. Because 10% wastage also, they have utilized it. So that's another aspect. Uh, that's another webinar we should be having for how to prevent the wastage and other things. But they have been all trained. All the essential things are there. They 
equipments are brought as per the specification, which are decided by the experts. Uh, the experts include international experts as well as the national experts. And after the procurement, the equipments are being provided comprehensive maintenance as well as annual maintenance, depending on the type, depending on the age of the equipment. This is all which I can say. But regulating the equipments in the private sector, that's uh, beyond the scope of this discussion. Thank you, Dr. Madan. Dr. Uh, Mr. Shahab, you wanted to add something? No, I think sir already mentioned the fact that, that UNICEF and WHO do publish also complementing to a lot of this on the private sector side. They have a cold chain equipment optimization platform, which UNICEF runs together with Gavi that publishes a lot of material online on this. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of this very interesting webinar. And uh, I really want to thank all the speakers for sharing those meaningful insights on, the, on how we are using technology in strengthening medical cold chain infrastructure and its impact on immunization programs in difficult to reach areas. Appreciate all experts for joining us today and a very big thank you to the attendees for joining in. Please take care and stay tuned. Thank you.